Heart to Heart, a Catholic media ministry, presents Good News Today, featuring an inspiring gospel teaching by Father Jim Willig. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. When Judas had left them, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and God will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little while longer. I give you a new commandment. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you also should love one another. This is how all will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Today's Gospel, uh, this Last Supper Discourse, as it's sometimes called or otherwise referred to as the Farewell Address of Jesus, covers an entire four full chapters in John's Gospel, starting with this section in chapter 13, midway, where our Gospel picks up today, verse 31. Scholars would tell us that Probably Jesus didn't say all of these things in that Last Supper. The disciples probably would have been dozing off at that point. There's so much to cover. In fact, probably what the evangelist did in writing this gospel is to take some liberty to remember and glean some of the high points and highlights of Jesus' teaching over the latter period of time of his life and put them into a great context of Jesus' last teaching, that's his preeminent teaching, that would summarize most of what he tried to teach and hand on to his disciples. So that what we're reading here is a kind of a last will and testament of Jesus, which says it's this is of most in, and greatest importance. Add to that the exact framing that John uses, I think uh, most intentionally, in this gospel verses that we look at today. Right before we begin, we're told, in fact, the first line is, Judas had left the cynical. The cynical is that upper room where the disciples shared this Last Supper meal with their Lord Jesus Christ. And we're told that Judas has just left. So, mind you, Jesus had just predicted that his betrayer was at hand. And he who dips the morsel with me is he who would hand me over. And then we have this reading. And immediately following these verses, the next verse that follows is where Jesus predicts Peter's betrayal or his denial that's soon coming by the end of the night. So what I think is interesting about that certain framing of this particular gospel is that in the back of my mind, I imagine this Last Supper scene in a probably too romantic a setting. You know, I think dim lights, candle lit, romantic kind of view of the Last Supper scene where Jesus is enjoying this last intimate moment with the people he loves the most. Whereas, in fact, most of the meal is taking place in the shadows of his disciples who are all about ready to abandon him. Because with, we're going to hear about Jesus calling them to love. And I think, well, yeah, I could love the people who love me, and I could love people if I just had a different boss or a different co-worker or different people really appreciated me more. I could really love them more. In fact, when Jesus is saying this, he's well aware that none of his disciples are responding well to him. Two of them 
as extreme examples, Judas will betray him for 30 pieces of silver. Talk about selling him short and selling out. Just something to think about. Jesus is well aware of this as he's speaking these words of deep love. It's really quite a context. And then Peter, on the other hand, who will betray him. So in that frame of mind, we approach these words that Jesus speaks at that table setting that has more shadow than light. Think of that. So I'm breaking through this romantic dinner table setting to picture the real situation where this circle of intimate disciples is split clear down the middle. So, with that being said, we're told Jesus then left the cynical and then Jesus can begin his final farewell address. Judas is being led by the evil one. He's leaving the light, going out into the darkness to sell his faith. He's obviously being led by Satan. And we have to beware of that force of darkness within our lives. And there's never a time, never a situation where the evil one is not at work. In fact, I, I'm more and more reminded, as I said here before, the more we could see God working, speaking, being present to us, the more we could expect the feel the force of the evil one opposing us. So here we see that in this very Last Supper setting. Then Jesus begins his farewell address by saying, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. First, that phrase, Son of Man, is something that Jesus often referred to himself in a theological or scriptural way. It's a phrase used in the book of Daniel to represent servant of the Lord. So now I am to be glorified and God is glorified in me. Now what is the glory he's speaking of? John the Evangelist always refers to the crucifixion as Jesus' hour of glory. Now isn't that a paradox? Think of that. Thinking of the worst moment of human history and the greatest tragedy as being a moment of glory? No more than we would, when we go through our most difficult time in life, would we say, what a moment of glory. Although I will say this, and this came to my mind, how do we experience the most difficult moment as, on the other hand, the greatest moment? An example is when I listen to mothers talk about their childbirth experience. And oftentimes, I've heard mothers say, that giving birth to their children was, in fact, the greatest experience of their life. However, as they describe it, it would seem to me to be the worst experience of their life, right? And it just doesn't make sense, except that from such difficult labor can come the new birth, new life. And if that is true with childbirth, and how might that be true with the kind of rebirth that we can experience in a spiritual way. Mindful what John said much earlier in the Gospel, that we all must be born again. And there's no being born again without labor pains, and without contractions, that very difficult tension that we have to deal with. So we see mothers who sacrifice themselves in their very body to bring forth the birth of this new body, this new child of God. And they can look back on it only after the fact as one of the greatest blessings, the greatest moment of their life. That's how Christians are invited to look back on their hardship. I have a good friend who's overdue. She's past due. Her due date was Sunday. And, of course, it's very difficult. She can't even sleep hardly an hour without being stirred by this baby stirring her. And she's anxious about her delivery. And her, in fact, it's comical because her husband reminded her that last time in, in that transition period, she said, is there any way that we could get this baby out another way? <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to laugh but knew better. And isn't that our feeling? Is there any other way that we could get through this, whatever it is God has us in. 
you know, childbirth is just a wonderful model of our own spiritual growth. Mothers can appreciate that much better than me. But that's what I think John is talking about in Jesus' transition, in Jesus' crucifixion that led them to the new life of the resurrection that we then speak of in terms of glory. John continues in that language by saying, God will then glorify him, referring to Jesus himself, and will glorify him soon. Obviously, John speaks of this hour of glory when he looks back through the lens of the resurrection. In hindsight of knowing how God worked through all this, he could then see Jesus' crucifixion as the greatest sign of Jesus' love. And I think that's what he means by glory, is that if you look at the cross, you can see what John had written earlier in the Gospel, greater love than this no one has than they lay down their life for their friends. And there's no greater example of that than Jesus sacrificing himself entirely on the cross and then giving us that hope of everlasting life with him. So, this is what John's trying to communicate by speaking of the cross in the language of Jesus' glorification. Now, what's interesting to me, though, historically, is to look back and see it took Christians several hundred years later before they grasped that paradox. And it, I guess it takes us a long time before we could call our hardships blessings. You know, when we're going through them, we can't see it, we can't feel it, we can't know it's a blessing but just to have that hope that God would work something for the good. The early Christians, in fact, this is interesting, did not use the cross as a symbol at first. Did you know that? They didn't make the sign of the cross. They didn't have crucifixes or crosses in their homes because they saw it more as a sign of scandal. I mean, they would be for maybe analogous to imagine using a guillotine or an electric chair or some form of torture. That's what the cross meant, is the worst form of torture and execution. So early Christians avoided that sign. And it wasn't until the beginning of the 4th century, when Constantine was vying for the position of emperor for the Roman Empire, that he had a vision where he saw a cross appear in the sky and heard a voice say, By this sign, you shall conquer. And he understood that vision and then ordered all of his soldiers to have a cross painted on their shield before they went into battle. And as the Lord had blessed them to then conquer by this sign, and Constantine then became the emperor of the Roman Empire and for the first time ended the persecution of Christians, and ended the form of execution by crucifixion. And Constantine was later converted to Christ himself, particularly through his own mother, St. Helena, who, by the way, founded many of the places in the Holy Land when she traveled there and had these different places remembered and honored and monuments were built so that today when we go back, it was often St. Helena, mother of Constantine, who we credit for these places that were marked for centuries by tradition, but by her in terms of monuments that we know are sacred sites, such as the place of the Holy Sepulchre where Jesus was crucified. Isn't that interesting piece of history? By the way, it was beginning the fourth century then, cross took on a new meaning, a new purpose, and people then began to sign themselves with the sign of the cross, and put little crosses and even crucifixes in their homes and put little jewels sometimes on them to decorate them because they were a sign of glory, a sign of beauty. But remember the connection here, something horrible becoming something beautiful, something of tragedy becoming glory. And can we do that with our own memory? God taking something like death or divorce or disease or difficulty or whatever it might be, and believe that somehow that can be, as my mom always said, someday all you kids will be a jewel in my crown. (laughs) Which means we're not there yet. (laughs) But someday we'll be that jewel in the crown. Right now we're a cross, but uh, (laughs) but can we believe every cross can become a crown or, or at least part of the glory? 
So all of that is kind of a historical development, I think, of this kind of theology that John's promoting, of looking at our cross as a sign of glory. That's what we're invited to do in this Easter season. It takes eyes of faith and a heart of hope. And I think that's what God wants to give us more than anything in this Easter season, that we could take our crosses, work with our crosses, and carry them to the point where uh, we know that they can convert into greater glory and blessing for us. Back to the gospel. Jesus then says to his disciples, My children, I just want to pause there for a moment. Isn't it interesting he calls these adult men my children? In effect, this is how Jesus must have felt this great affection for them. In using this diminutive expression, it suggests a very tenderly fatherly feeling for them. In fact, he had given them spiritual life, nurtured them spiritually, discipled them all these years, and now was leaving them. So he must have felt like a real father to them. He says, my children, I'm not to be with you much longer. Obviously, Jesus is anticipating his death. Jesus would have certainly seen the handwriting on the wall, which is why he was so intent on sharing this last Passover supper. Now, this is very meaningful for the evangelist to see that this Passover, remember when the angel of death was passed over to giving life that the Jewish people could be led to the promised land. And this is what Jesus will be doing. He's the Lamb of God who sacrificed, the Lamb sacrificed at the Passover meal that's shared. Jesus will be the Lamb of God, as we say at Mass every day offered for our salvation that we could enter into the promised land. And what's the promised land? But the presence of God, that we could be invited to walk with him each day. And so he's sharing this meal with them and telling them, this is the last time I will be with you. So he's really trying to get them to say, listen up, I, I have something very special to share with you. And now we hear what that is. For the next line, Jesus says, I give you a new commandment. Love one another. Our first thought should be, are you sure this is new? I mean, haven't we heard this before? I mean, frankly, the commandment to love is as old as Moses. It's in the Mosaic Law, in the Old Testament, love thy neighbor. So we ought to ask, what's new about this? Jesus had talked about it a lot before. What's new about this command to love one another? Jesus, I think, answers that very question in the next line of his address. He says, such as my love has been for you, so your love needs to be for each other. That's what's new about it. This love is based on they are to love one another as Jesus has loved them. In other words, I just don't want you to be nice to each other and be kind to each other. No, I want you to love each other as I have loved you. Now, they would have already have seen that, having lived with Jesus so much and shared so much over the years. But even in that meal, remember, uh, it began with Jesus washing their feet, something that only a slave did. And Jewish slaves at that were exempt from washing feet because it was such a uh, a disgusting thing. It would be analogous to us saying today, uh, I I may do house chores, but I don't do floors or windows. To wash feet was a stinky, dirty, ugly job. These people who walked in on mud streets and picked up every filth because there was no sewer system, and animals would make their deposits all along the way, and they'd walk in this stuff all day so that most Jewish homes had a pitcher of water at the door and they would you know, wash their own feet as they would be invited to be a guest to come inside. But Jesus took this form of the lowest servant of the household and did this humble service to all of his disciples. And this is what Jesus is talking about, how we need to love one another. Think of the lowest, most menial task. Uh, that's how we're asked to love one another. That's what's new about it the depth of it, the commitment of it, the humility of it. And greater love than this, again, no one has, and they lay down their life. That's what Jesus means. The word that John uses in the gospel, you would know this, you've heard it before, is agape. The Greeks had a number of words 
for love, eros, philia, eros from which we have erotic love or sensual love, philia from which we have familiar love, friendly, affectionate love. But agape meant sacrificial love, love that expresses itself by sacrificing yourself. And that's the word John uses when Jesus speaks of this new commandment to love one another. So that this love is defined in the very nature of sacrifice. Which, you know, I love that word sacrifice because it comes from two Latin words. Sacrum facio means to make holy. So that whatever we make that kind of deep self-offering, it's a holy gift. Then Jesus says, now it's by this kind of love, this agape love, that people will know you are my disciples. In fact, the early Christians will even call that kind of gathering and re-celebrating of the Lord's Supper as the agape meal. And at that meal, they try to remember this service to each other. And often one of the apostles would stand up and speak at the meal in the name of Jesus. And this very evangelist, St. John, is reported to have often stood up in his community and reminded them of what Jesus said and asked them, remembering these last words, my brothers and sisters, let us love one another. And according to the legend, the community after a while got tired of hearing the same sermon over again and said, John, haven't you more to say? And he said, there is no more to say. This is what it's all about, in effect. I want to share a great story I came across some years ago that I think is a wonderful illustration of this gospel of love, the sacrificial giving Jesus is asking of us. A man by the name of Shel Silverstein converted from Judaism to Catholicism. And shortly after his conversion, a good friend from childhood, Father Brennan Manning met his old classmate Shell and asked about his newfound faith in Jesus Christ and invited him to share what is it that has captured your heart about Jesus. Shell Silverstein was so moved by that question, he didn't quite know how to answer it at first and asked if Father Brennan would give him a few more days to think about it and he would get back to him. And after taking an entire week, he then met again with Father Brennan and in that time had written a story that he presented to him that day. It was entitled, The Giving Tree. Many of you are familiar with this beautiful, simple parable about selfless love and giving. But think of it now in terms of this man's appreciation for the love of Jesus that was a, truly a gift that kept on giving and giving and giving. A story about a young boy in a tree and their love for each other and how the boy played in the tree's branches and ate her apples and rested in his shade and the tree was happy. But the boy grew older. His needs grew greater. He wanted money. He wanted shelter. He wanted a boat to get away. And the tree was always obliged to give in whatever way. And so he gave the boy her apples to be sold, her limbs to be cut down to build a shelter, and even her trunk to be used as a boat. And the boy sailed away, and the tree was happy. But later, this little boy returns as an old man, and there's nothing but a stump that's left. And he has nothing more to give and the boy says, but my teeth are too weak for apples anyway. And I'm too old to swing on branches, not to worry. And I'm too tired to climb any trunk. And so the tree offered its simple stump as a place to sit and rest, which is exactly what the little boy, the old man, wanted. And the story ends, and the tree was happy. And it reminds me of how mothers and fathers give and give and give of their love and of themselves, of their time, and give and give and give till there's nothing more to give. And it's what makes them happy. Most of the time. <laughs> this is the kind of love the Lord is asking of us. Not that we should learn to give to ourselves too. So we have something to give. 
But this is the kind of love to which Jesus is calling all of us. And it's in that experience of agape, sacrificial love, that I believe we find our happiness and the fullness of the life. Amen. Heart to Heart welcomes you back next week for another inspiring edition of Good News Today. If you are interested in other books, CDs, DVDs, or digital downloads by Father Jim or Father Michael, you can call toll-free 1-877-208-4875 or visit our website, www.heartoheart.org. There, you can also sign up to receive a weekly reminder to listen to these same programs online. And please, consider a donation of any size to help support Heart to Heart's radio and internet ministry. That's www.heartoheart.org or call 1-877-208-4875. Thank you for listening and may God bless your heart and the hearts of all of your loved ones. Heart to heart, hand in hand, praying for grace to understand, Spirit of Jesus' 